Okay, let's start again. It's now my pleasure to introduce our second international keynote speaker, Don Tapscott. Don is one of the world's leading authorities on business strategy and the chairman of NGEN Era. He's an internationally sought writer, consultant, and speaker on business strategy and organizational transformation. Don's clients include top executives of many of the world's largest corporations as well as government leaders from many countries. He's the author of 12 widely read books about information technology and business, business and society. Uh, the, the last one was published in October. Uh, it's titled Grown Up Digital, How the Net Generation is Changing the World. So far, Don's best known book, which was co-written co by co-written co by, uh, sorry, with Anthony Williams uh, was called uh, Economics: How Mass Collaboration Changes Everything. You might have seen that on airports and, 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 and all the big bookstores in the world. It was the number one management bestseller in the U.S. last year. Don is the adjunct professor of management in University of Toronto. Please welcome Don Tapscott. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. This is actually, uh, I live in Toronto. This is my second time in Europe this week. I've been, I've been I started out in Toronto. I came over, I was in Milan, and, uh, and then I, I did the, uh, the book launch for Europe in London for Grown Up Digital. And then I went back to Toronto yesterday, and I'm back here in Finland. So I'm sort of like, I'm, and, uh, I'm looking forward to having a meal tonight that's not on an airplane. So. <laughs> Um, but I have, I've, I've been to uh, Helsinki a number of times and I'm very interested in your uh, country. And uh, I suppose as a Canadian that we have a certain affinity. Like I look out the door there and it looks like outside of the door of my country place as well. So um, I, in the next, uh, how long do I have? 45 minutes. 45 minutes. I'd like to try and convince you of the following proposition. that. Uh, Due to some powerful forces in the global economy, a new technology paradigm, a demographic revolution, a social revolution, and a profound change in business, we are now moving into a period where there's a new paradigm emerging in government, in how governments operate and more broadly orchestrate capability to create and deliver services but also in the nature of governance itself, the nature of democracy, and the relationship between citizens and the state. And that these ideas of reinventing governments have been ideas in waiting for these changes to occur. And now is the time when we're actually beginning to see some profound change. Because so far when it's, when it's come to um, the reinvention of government or e-gov or or uh, government online and so on, the changes have been very limited. We've taken existing business processes and structures and applied technology to them. Sort of, you know, a cow wanders through the woods and it creates a cow path? Well, we've been paving the cow path rather than making fundamental change to our institutions of government. So that's a tall order. Uh, and we'll have lots of time to talk about it as well. So let's get into it. If there's a, a more significant Exhibit A that government is changing, it's the election of the senator from Ohio, Barack Obama. He came to power through a social movement of millions of people, many of them young people, many of those not old enough to vote. But they used the new web and they self-organized to bring him to power. And the way I found out that something big was going on here 
was a couple of years ago, someone sent me an email saying, did you know that this guy, Barack Obama, has a, a web community named Barack, mybarackobama.com where people can self-organize to build communities. And one of the communities that they have built is a community around your book, Wikonomics. And these were people who I'd never met, and I still don't know who they are, who thought that my book was the key to getting Barack Obama elected and the key to transforming government. So I sort of joined this community and I, as a silent third party, kind of witnessed what was going on. It wasn't very active, but it was enormously interesting. And uh, as much as I might like to flatter myself thinking that my book was the key to uh, his victory, there was also a community for young firefighters in Des Moines who support Barack Obama. And there was a community of single moms for daycare who support Barack Obama in Cleveland. And there were literally tens of thousands of other communities that were built. And if uh, Roosevelt was the first radio president with his fireside chats, and JFK was the first television president with the Cuban Missile Crisis unfolding on TV, Obama will be the first internet president. And the web and this intersection with young people is not only enabled him to get elected, I think it's going to change the way that he governs and the, the nature of democracy itself. So I say this uh, with some authority, it's not just the uh, opinion of a author, but we are doing a research project called Government 2.0, Wikonomics, Government and Democracy. And CITRA, thank you very much, is a member of this program. So through CITRA, all of you have access to $4 million worth of, of research, it's case studies, methods, approaches, tools, in, intellectual property. And all of you have rights to hold an executive briefing for the senior management of your government department or agency. And we've done our best to pull together the world's leading thinkers, uh, thinking about the transformation of government. And um, the, uh, the results, I, I think, are, are quite profound and are enormously helpful. In London two days ago, I met with a guy named Tom Watson, who's the minister in charge of the reinvention of government. And we talked about how this intellectual property is going to be applied to making some very profound changes in the whole modus operandi of the British government. And among other things, we're working on a plan whereby the prime minister of the UK is going to take a first step towards digital democracy by holding what we call a three-day uh, digital brainstorm for the entire population of, um, of, the, of the UK. So what are these big drivers? Well, let me just describe quickly four of them. A new web intersecting with a demographic revolution. The children of the baby boom are the first generation to grow up digital and they're different. Creating a social revolution where you have 200 million people on MySpace Facebook growing at a million new members, active members per week, and a new blog created every second of the day, 24 hours of the day. And all of this leading to an economic revolution. Social networking is becoming social production. And we're beginning to see some deep changes in how we get capability to produce things in society. And all of these are leading to some far-reaching changes, I think, in the nature of government and governance itself. The New Web, my company, New Paradigm, was acquired by a company based in Texas called Engineera. And as they may say in Texas, this Web 2.0, it ain't your daddy's internet, okay? We've got a fundamental change. The Web of today is a fundamentally different creature than the Web of the dot-com period. The web of the dot-com period was a limited technology that you access through a PC. Now you access it through billions, 
soon trillions of inert objects that become smart communicating devices. I have a friend in Toronto, everything in his house that has electrical power has an IP address that means his toaster and his refrigerator are connected to the internet. And the two of them talk. I have no idea what the conversation is between them, but he was bragging that his fence talks to his sprinkler system. And I said, well, why would you care? He said, if a burglar comes over the fence, the sprinkler is my first line of defense. So this is pervasive ambient computing. And the touch points for a government to communicate with people are not just uh, PCs, but they're billions of inert objects. The new web is broadband. The new web is true multimedia. The new web is enriched with services. The old web was a platform for the presentation of content based on this technology called HTML, standard. The new web is based on something called XML, which is a standard not for presentation, but for computation. The internet is becoming a giant global computer. And every time you go on it, you're programming this computer. And when we all are working off a single giant global computer, that means that we have a global platform for collaboration and for building communities. And finally, the old web integrates with traditional IT. As a government department, your information technology that was your bread and butter IT didn't really interact with the internet at all. It was separate. The only way they came together was around something called the intranet. It was very limited. Well now, every government agency needs to move their, move their IT onto this giant global computer. So, this is a huge challenge, of course, because all of you have this little detail called the legacy, right? The irresistible force of the new web is meeting up with an immovable object of a three trillion euro installed base. And I know some of the systems in your departments are old enough to vote and drink. And uh, God may have created the world in six days, but he didn't have an installed base. Okay, this is a big challenge that we all have. But this is an historic change that's happening in terms of technology. Now there's another change that we have the first generation to come of age in the digital age. I started studying these kids about 15 years ago when I noticed how my own children were effortlessly able to use all this sophisticated technology. At first I thought my children are prodigies. And, uh, but then I noticed that all their friends were like them, so that was a bad theory. So any of you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. More nephews or nieces. So a dozen years ago I wrote this book, Grown Up Digital. Flash forward to today, the eldest of these kids are 30. They're coming into the workforce, they're coming into the marketplace, they're coming into society, they're becoming citizens, and I'm convinced there's no more powerful force to change the world than this new generation. Exhibit A, again, they just elected their first president of the world's largest economy. So, this, these kids are different. The, the baby boomers, my generation, grew up watching television for 24 hours a week. In, in the US. And these kids watch less TV and they watch it differently. They come home, they turn on their computer and they're in three different windows talking to their friends and texting and you know listening to MP3 files or three magazines open and a video game. Go oh, and they're doing their homework at the same time. The television may be going on as background, ambient media. Okay? It's, it's like music. And when they're online, what are they doing? Rather than being the passive recipients of somebody else's broadband, or somebody else's video, they're reading and thinking and organizing and composing their thoughts and telling their stories and so on. This is creating a generation whose brains are different. And you know something? The old model of government, I vote, you rule. I vote, you broadcast me for whatever, four years. This is not going to be acceptable for a generation that's grown up interacting and collaborating. We have an historic opportunity. And these kids are different, 
as consumers of government services, they're different as talent for government, and they're also different as citizens. And I'll be explaining this. Now these are called population pyramids. At the bottom are children zero to four, at the top 85 and plus. And on the left are males, on the right are females. So the upper left is Finland in 1990. The upper right is Finland in 2008. This is a big problem. You don't have a lot of young people in Finland. If we were to look at this chart for India, its shape would be like this. In the United States, it looks like this. Baby boom, the Gen X, and then the echo of the boom. The net generation, as I call them. So, I don't think there's any more strategic issue, actually, facing people who think about creating wealth and social development and justice and good governance in Finland than to come to grips with the fact that there's going to be a huge talent shortage and a war for talent that will take place in every institution. And you can see, going up to 2025 and 2050, this is uh, 2050. Look at on the right there. The 85 plus are women. It's good to be a woman uh, mm -hmm. if you're going to be old. <laughs> Isn't that an astonishing thing? So that's a big factor, and we'll come back to that in a second. Now, these young people are not just using the internet, they're changing it. I could show you 30 charts, and they all look like this. They show the old HTML website being eclipsed by the XML-based community. So Facebook beats Match.com, and uh, Flickr beats Kodak EasyShare. You see, in Flickr, you build communities. Kodak EasyShare is a website. I've banned the term website at Engineera. We don't build websites. Website, it's such a dot-com idea, don't you think? Now, I'm, I'm exaggerating for emphasis here, but don't think about websites. Content is king. No. Community is king. Collaboration is king. Creating a context whereby people can self-organize to create their own content and to collaborate. That's what the new web is all about. So, um, you know, Wikipedia beats uh, uh, Britannica. And uh, on and on it goes. MySpace. So this could be Facebook beats... Oh, no, sorry. This could be... Uh, uh, yeah, MySpace, or it could be YouTube, beats MTV. See, MTV is the old model. We create content. We hope you enjoy our music videos. MySpace says, no, we create a platform whereby you self-organize to create your own content. There are 45,000 rock bands on MySpace. So let me uh, just tell you a humbling story about this. It was Christmas Day two years ago. And I gave my son, Alex, an advanced copy of Wikinomics. He was 20 years old in his third year at university. And he said, uh, thanks, Dad. And he went off. He started reading the book. He came back a couple hours later. And he said, hey, Dad, this is a good book. It's like he was surprised or something. But um, he said, I think I'm going to create a community on Facebook. And I said, do you mind if I watch? Fifteen minutes later, he's created the Wikinomics community. Another 15 minutes later, he has six members. By the time we're eating turkey on Christmas night, he has 130 members in seven countries, seven regional coordinators, a president, secretary, and chief information officer for the community. He sent out a PDF of the first two chapters of the book. I got kids writing back in saying, uh, Mr. Tapscott, we found errors in your book. <laughs> And the community is placing demands on me. How exactly will Mr. Topscott be contributing to our community? It's like, what is this? Well, it occurred to me, you know, Bob Dylan says there's something going on here and you don't know what it is. Two words, self-organization. Self-organization has been around throughout human history. Language was developed through self-organization. There was no central committee of the English language that said this will be called a book. It just kind of happened. But what used to take place over millennia 
or centuries can now happen over weeks or on a single Christmas day. When I was 20 years old, I never could have created a community in seven countries of 130 people, regardless of what I did. Alex did it on a single Christmas day. Do you know what else was a product of self-organization? Government. And people can now self-organize to create the capability of citizenship. We'll come back to that in a second. So we've got a technology revolution, demographic revolution, social revolution, driving a new era of self-organization, leading to an economic revolution. The deep structure and architecture of the corporation, the institution that we've chosen to innovate and create wealth in society, because the other approaches didn't work. It's not saying corporations are perfect either, but as the current financial crisis shows us, markets, while necessary, are completely insufficient to create wealth. But this corporation is changing quite fundamentally. Throughout the 20th century, it was vertically integrated. It did everything from soup to nuts. And what technology is doing is dropping collaboration costs within corporations, but also outside the boundaries of companies. So that peers can now come together and create value. So think about that. If you can create an encyclopedia with a million people who've never met, it's 10 times bigger than Britannica, it's in 90 languages, probably including Finnish, the quality is just as good as Britannica, but nobody owns it. The quality is just as good according to the big study that's been done. Looked at scientific articles, the error rate's about the same. If you can do that, what else could you create? Could you create an operating system, software? Well, Linux is the dominant operating system for large-sized computers in the world. Nobody owns it. It's created by volunteers. And Linux now has some big customers like China. Could you create a mutual fund? It's called marketocracy.com. Could you create a physical good like a motorcycle? The Chinese motorcycle industry is a product of peer production. There's no company. There's a bunch of little companies and they all cooperate together on the internet and they meet in tea houses. So you make wheels and you do ignition and she uh, sells and he collects the money and you do aftermarket support and service. This is now one third of all motorcycle production. It's the largest motorcycle industry in the world. There's no Yamaha pulling all the strings. So social networking is becoming social production. And companies need to figure out how to harness this vast new capability that exists. So we've gone from industrial age corporations to business webs like Cisco, someone mentioned earlier, where you focus on what you do best and you build a network to do the rest, up to mass collaboration, where vast pools of labor can come together to create things. I think this is taking us into a new age of participation where people can now participate in the con economy in ways that were previously unthinkable. So you can, you can not only use software, you can be part of the creation of the most important operating system in the world as a volunteer. You know, you can become a broadcaster, not just a recipient of broadcasting. You can not only read the encyclopedia, you can write the encyclopedia. You can not only read a book, you can create a book. And there are dozens of projects to create wiki books. The final chapter of Wikinomics is a wiki. There's 1,500 people writing the final chapter of Wikinomics, and it's a real-time thing. You can fight crime without being part of the police department by doing a mashup of Google, of local crime statistics and, and, and uh, Google Maps. You're some poor kid in, in uh, Mumbai, where I was last week at the Taj Hotel. Ugh. Um, but you can go to MIT, because MIT's opened up its courseware. 
Now you won't get a degree, but you can learn how to become a hotshot computer programmer and then you can join the top coder network of 200,000 programmers and maybe somebody in Finland will hire you to build an application even though you're living, uh, even though you're living in Mumbai. So this, this is an exciting age. You know, something comes along like Katrina and the re authorities respond badly. You can participate in saving lives and solving a crisis. People went on to Google Maps. Woman in second floor of office building or of, of house in wheelchair, water eight feet and rising and many lives were saved. So I think there's strong evidence that this is beginning to change many, many aspects of society, not just the economy. Take something like healthcare. Look at this self, what self-organization is doing at the top. We have people self-organizing to create information like WebMD. You have blogs and discussion groups like Doctissimo that has millions of people on it in France. You have question and answer websites like, uh, uh, like AnswerBag. Wikis like WikiHow. Um, uh, Wikipedia Medicine, Cancer Wiki, Flu Wiki, where people come together and collectively create value. Swarm Intelligence, where people swarm around a problem, a medical problem like CERMO. Rate MDs, rate my doctor. And then you've got support communities like Caring Bridge. If you have a rare disease in the past, this was a huge problem, you're totally isolated. Well now there are all kinds of these rare disease communities that are coming together. Self-organization is transforming healthcare. And this is a wonderful opportunity. When you're born, you should get a website. The government should give you a web page, and that becomes your medical record with different levels of privacy. And you control your record, and you have tra complete transparency, unlike what exists today. And if you're provided with these kinds of tools and the ability to self-organize, you will. If you have diabetes, and tools to measure your blood sugar level and collaborate with others, you will use these tools and that will reduce the cost of health care because the citizens will take the burden on themselves. Same thing is true for learning. Look at these things. Curriki, Classroom 2.0, eLearn, eConnections, and so on. The model of learning that we have today I think is quite inappropriate for the 21st century. It's based on Oh, I call it broadcast learning. It's a hierarchical model. I'm a teacher, I have knowledge, you're a student, you're an empty vessel, you don't have knowledge, get ready, here it comes. And your goal is to take it into short-term active working memory and through practice and repetition to build deeper cognitive structures so you can recall it to me when I test you. And if you're in the United States, there's gonna be a lot more testing. This is the goal of the education system, to produce students who perform well on tests. Well, is that what we need for a knowledge economy? Where it's not so much the facts that you know when you graduate, it's your capacity to learn lifelong. This model of learning is one way, it's one size fits all, it's teacher focused, and the student is isolated in the learning process. We can move to a new model. And again, the new web and information technology is at the heart of that. To a multi-way, student-focused, highly customized, collaborative model of learning. When you do this, and I'm involved uh, in, in doing this in countries around the world, you get better learning. You get kids who are turned on. You get better performance, even on tests. So we have a wonderful new opportunity to reinvent every one of these institutions. Let's say something like global warming. It's a big problem and everyone now agrees um, that climate change is a problem and it's related to human behavior. So the big difficulty with this issue, as Thomas Friedman points out, is that the people most aggrieved by climate change are not yet born. And this is not about buying a Prius or something like that. We need to reindustrialize the planet. And we have, what, a few short decades to, be, to do this. Or else all kinds of really bad things, unthinkably bad things, are going to happen 
on this planet. How are we going to do that? Well, Tom Friedman, and he's, you know, I have great respect for him, says you've got to get governments involved. Governments need to force it because it's an act of stewardship that's being required here, and we're not going to voluntarily do that. Well, he may be right, but there's another thing that's emerging here. We're in the early days of the first ever global movement on planet Earth where everybody's on the same side. The world has been mobilized before around world wars, but we were on different sides. There are now millions, soon tens of millions, I believe we will see in my lifetime, hundreds of millions of people who are taking some kind of action and collaborating together based on the new web to solve this huge problem. So, this is a lot more than e-gov or government online or something like that. We're talking about bringing about some very profound changes to every institution in society and to every aspect of wealth creation and social development. I'm prepared to defend that statement. I don't think it's an exaggeration that we're in the early days of some far-reaching change. So, what I'm going to do is to pick up three topics. And I'll just like to stick, my, my goal here is, is not that you'll remember the, uh, the 14 new models of uh, digital democracy or something like that, as you will see in a second. My goal is to just basically stimulate you to check out this uh, research that we've done and to see if it's applicable and if it's helpful to you. Three big areas. How does all this change the way that we create and deliver services? in our societies? How does it change the way we think about talent and government? And how are governments going to be winners in the war for talent in Finland? And thirdly, what does this mean for policy and for the, the nature of the democratic process and for the relationship between citizens and their states? So let's look at these three. We'll start with services. First decade of government, uh, sorry, did I say? first decade of e-government, this is pretty much was the state of the art. Uh, we're trying to deal, deal with something with uh, paper. We automated things, but they went into silos. Um, we had uh, all kinds of multi-levels. There were few channels. It was very passive. We're moving to a new model. And let me kind of, kind of explain um, the difference here. E-gov in the past, governments would try and create a one-stop shopping, a government portal, as they call it in the UK, joined up government. Well, these are admirable things to do. But while necessary, they're completely insufficient and sub-optimized for, for where we're going. Let's take an example of the FBI. Rather than creating a portal, a crime portal, they're using the new web, the web 2.0, so that for something like the 10 most wanted list, rather than you coming to government, a little widget goes out with the 10 most wanted list and embeds itself in cash registers of convenience stores. So rather than you come to one-stop, joined-up government, government goes out into society where it ought to be and where it's appropriate. This is the power of the new web. We have the tools to be able to do that. Uh, one kid that I was, you know, not a kid, she's 22 years old, that I was interviewing, I asked her, do you use electronic mail? And she says, well, no, that's like yesterday's technology. And I said, well, if you did use email, what would you use it for? She says, email, that's, that's a good technology for sending a thank you letter to one of your friend's parents. That would be a good use of email, I guess. How do we get beyond email? We have wikis, blogs, jams, social networks, collaborative filtering, telepresence, RSS feeds. These are the new tools of 21st century collaboration. But what are we doing? Well, in many countries, rather than embracing these tools, we ban them. It's very popular in the United States to ban Facebook in federal government agencies. I was talking to the CIO of a state 
and the governor had banned Facebook. And I asked the CIO, why did he do that? He said, young people are wasting their time on Facebook at work. And I said, well, if young people are wasting their time, is that a technology problem that you can get rid, rid of by eliminating a technology? Or is that a bigger problem that has to do with management and workflow and motivation and job design? He said, so I said to him, what was the effect of banning Facebook? He said, everybody went to MySpace. <laughs> Rather than doing what we should be doing, we do the opposite. I talked to another youngster, I actually interviewed him on a panel in front of a group of government leaders. He works for a US federal agency that had banned Facebook. I said, what was the effect of banning Facebook? He had a different answer. He said, it was the single most demoralizing thing that management has ever done that I'm aware of. It said to every young person, we don't understand your tools we don't understand collaboration, and we don't trust you. There's a big opportunity here. Now, often it's the opposite of what we think as we go into the, this new world. Take something, people often say to me, well, Don, all this economics and openness and collaboration and so on. What about security? Well, you know how the CIA is increasing security? It's by being more open and by sharing information and by enhancing collaboration and by breaking down walls. So this young kid comes to work for the CIA. He's always wanted to be a spy. He's got a computer science degree. He can hardly wait to get seven floors down and look at these massive gazillion dollar mainframes. He gets down there and he looks around. They're 15 year old mainframes and they don't do certain things like search. So he wonders, there's got to be a better way. He starts using Google. And he starts using the public tools on the internet. He starts coming up with all this good stuff. And he starts getting people collaborating. One thing leads to the next. You have Intellipedia, which is a wiki-based collaboration amongst the intelligence agencies. And soon, we'll reach out to you. So if you see something weird at an airport, you'll be able to participate to enhance security. We enhance security by opening up. Now how about, how do we innovate in government? How do we, how do we get capability to do things? Well, um, if, has, has anyone here read Wikinomics? Okay. Both Wikinomics and Grown Up Digital, the way to get them is in massive volume, okay? <laughs> Multiple copies. <laughs> Christmas is coming soon. <laughs> you look like people with friends. Do you have employees? Anybody here? No, seriously. Um, in Wikinomics, I talk about this thing called an ideagora. This is like the Roman agora, a marketplace, only it's a marketplace for ideas. So Procter & Gamble is looking for a molecule that'll take red wine off a shirt. They have 9,000 chemists inside their boundaries and a million outside. So they go to the Innocentive Ideagora, it's called Innocentive, and sure enough there's a retired chemist in Helsinki or a grad student in Taipei that comes up with a molecule. Procter & Gamble pays them. Half of all of their innovation comes from outside the company. We think the talent is inside our boundaries. Well, no, it can be outside as well. So. I'm a little bit behind here, so I'm going to kind of uh, pick things up a bit. But here's one. It's called peer to patent. You know, in the United States, the patent agencies are hit notoriously long. Uh, it's a notoriously long process to get a patent. And often, patents are given away inappropriately. And a big part of the problem and the delay is something called prior art. So you come up with an idea, the patent agency needs to figure out if someone else has this idea already. So they get a whole bunch of people doing research. Well now, what they've done is they post the problem on the new web, people collaborate, and prior art, if it exists, appears almost instantly, dramatically increasing the entire process and saving a whole bunch of money and ending up with more, with, with more integrity to the patent process. 
So, again, it's about opening up. We think the governments do this stuff by getting people inside their boundaries, and then we create services and we deliver them to consumers. But there's an opportunity to rethink the division of labor in society regarding who does what. So, Neighborhood Knowledge Los Angeles is what I call a governance web, where governments provide data about communities that might show a community is in trouble. Housing code violations, petty crime statistics, school dropouts, and so on. Private companies provide a network infrastructure. Civil society organizations and NGOs provide the ability to intervene in a community, and they create a map of Los Angeles. And when the map starts to change color, that shows that a community is going into duress because the data feeds into the map. And then they intervene in the community and they stop problems before they become too big, as has happened in the past in LA. And this is not about outsourcing. It's not about privatization of government. There's nothing in in the first place. It's about a new division of labor and society enabled by the new web regarding how we create and deliver services. So that's a big change. The second big change has to do with talent. And I pointed this problem uh, uh, out to you. Governments can win the war for talent. And there's a new reason why. Young people care a lot about society. Their values are very, very strong. And in the United States, of the top five uh, sorry, the top ten organizations that young university graduates want to work for, five of them are governments or not-for-profits. So, if you look at this chart, most people in the U.S. still want to work for a private company, half of people. But in Europe, it's less. And you know what's happening? Young people are no longer of the Margaret, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan view that the best government is no government or a little government. They understand governments are a vehicle to do good things in society. They're not anti-government per se. Many of them are cynical about the governments they have, but they're not anti-government per se. And this really picked up after 9-11 where young people around the world started thinking the state is important in society, in protecting us and in doing good things. Oh, really? Okay, so I'm going to have to speed this up. So, um, so these kids are different. This is a kid who worked 52 weeks, 52 jobs. Here's a kid, grade six, raised $9 million in a Series A financing for his software product. When I was in grade six, I had a paper route. So we have an enormously capable generation. And to make a long story short, I'm convinced that the way you recruit, train, supervise, and retain people is all changing. In fact, those are all verbs you, should get, you shouldn't use. Because you, don't, you can't recruit young people in a traditional sense. Advertising is a complete waste of money. And you need to participate in their social networks and influence them. Rather than training departments, why do we increase the work, the learning component of work? Because it's knowledge work. Work and learning are the same thing. Do you know the training department of my company? It's called Everyone Has to Blog. That's our entire training department. It forces you to learn. You've got to write your ideas and communicate them. You don't supervise them in a traditional sense because they bring a new culture of collaboration into the workforce. And as for retaining them, this is a wonderful opportunity in countries like Finland that have a restricted youth population. You can get them in your organization even though they're outside the boundaries and maybe even in another country. So, these are seven guidelines. Um, they're in your hands. I don't have time to go through them now. So let me finish with the final thought here. Big changes to services 
big changes to talent. How about policy? Well, Obama, imagine if he stands up on Inauguration Day and he says to these tens of millions of young people, thank you for getting me elected. Now you go be passive for four years and then we're going to get to do it all over again. I don't think so. They want to be engaged in government. So there are all kinds of ways that that can occur. Transparency is a new theme. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. And let's face it, governments are going to be naked anyway. So if you're going to be naked, you need to be fit. You know, or as, uh, as I say in uh, the US, if you're going to be naked, you better be buff. Meaning, you need to be a good government. You need to have integrity, graft and corruption and all these things that exist in many developing countries. It's going to be tougher to be a corrupt official because of transparency. This is a very positive thing. My co-author in Wikonomics, Anthony Williams, this is uh, just something called theyworkforyou.com in the UK. He was studying at the London School of Economics, doing his PhD there. He can go on and find out who is his MP and find out everything about his MPs. Voting record, committees and topics of interest, recent appearances, um, uh, expenses. He can find out who the minister, what the, what the MP had for lunch if he wants to. Um, so some of this is extreme, government freedom of information, but overall this is a positive thing. Um, oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way here. There are all kinds of ways now that wikis can be used in the creation of policy. Politicopia in uh, Utah. More perfect is another example. The Green Party in Canada created its program through a wiki. All members of the Green Party could come and collaborate, just like they do around creating a Wikonomic, or sorry, a Wikipedia page. Then you can have things like digital brainstorms, what we hope to do in the UK. But the minister would come on television and say, for the next three days, we're going to have a conversation and the entire population can participate. This will occur on the internet and I'm going to participate in it every day. It worked for Habitat Jam. 45,000 people all around the world participated in a three-day conversation about human housing. It worked for IBM in their Innovation Jam where 400,000 people participated in a three-day conversation on brainstorming new business ideas for IBM. Why couldn't it work in Finland where you could have a million people participating in a three-day conversation? Pick a topic. What do you want? Global warming, improving the Finnish economy, Finland's role in the world, stopping crime. And uh, the goal is to catalyze initiatives. I'd love to talk to your prime minister about that. So these are in this research that we're doing, these are a bunch of different ones. They range from referenda and elections, but that's not fundamentally what this is about. You know, some people, Ross Perot, talked about the electronic town hall. You vote every night on the evening news. That's a bad idea, okay? Call that the electronic mob. Democracy is a lot more than majority rule on a nightly basis. One of the things it's about is protecting the rights of minorities. But as we move into this recommendation, education and idea zone, each of these is an internet enabled model of citizen engagement that changes the relationship between citizens and their governments. So wow, what an exciting time. Could we be moving from a, a model of democracy that's simply representative to more participatory, where consumers of government and citizens become active partners, where politics, rather than being one way and polarized and one to many, becomes a conversation where there's a marketplace for ideas. As the founding fathers in the United States, that was the language they used. And of course, there are some big issues that we can talk about, if you want, about the role of the state. Nation states, based on national economies, it's a good idea, except for the fact that we have a global economy now. And if the current financial crisis tells us anything, it's that we don't have institutions 
that are appropriate for the global economy. Regulation around capital markets is domestic, but surely everything is connected to everything else, as we've seen. So, wow, if the first wave of democracy established elected and accountable institutions of governments, there was a weak public mandate and citizens were inert. They voted and that was pretty much it. Could we move to a new model characterized by strong representation and a culture of public deliberation based on active citizenship? So these are some of the themes that we're working on. Moving away from hierarchies to network models, from vertically integrated to governance webs, just like we have business webs in the private sector from a plan and push model of government to an engage and co-create model, where governments don't only provide services, they co-innovate services and they create a context whereby people can self-organize to do things themselves. Where we shift from opacity to transparency, where we view talent being inside to talent being everywhere, and where the citizen is viewed being outside to the citizen becoming part of the network. It's flipping many things on, on its head. So let me uh, close with one final thought. Um, this is a new paradigm that I'm describing. And when you get a new paradigm, you get a crisis of leadership. Vested interests fight against change. Leaders of old paradigms are often the last to embrace the new. Galileo had a rough life trying to convince the church that the earth wasn't at the center of the universe. You know, he was only exonerated 15 years ago. The leaders of Newtonian physics fought against Einstein's general theory of relativity. Who are the computer companies having a terrible time today? Most of the leaders of the old paradigm in computing are gone. New paradigms are received with coolness, mockery, or hostility. How are we going to find the leadership for change? Well, I'd just like to throw that out there. I'll tell you, you know where leadership comes from in the governments that I've been studying? We've looked at hundreds of governments. It's a big surprise. Leadership can come from anywhere. Head of state, rare. Um, departmental head, can happen. Chief information officer, program manager. We documented a story of a secretary who was a critical person in the transformation of a huge organization, a clerical secretary, and she had what it took to be a leader. She willed it. You know, these are some of the themes that we're working on, and I was looking at the work that you've done at Citra. They're like shockingly um, similar. Strategic leadership. Um, you've, this demographic problem is necessitated necessitating renewal of the public sector. Recruiting and retaining talent means building a creative, tolerant, mer meritocratic, and innovative public sector. These tools allow transformation of productivity. Citizen-centric outcomes and user orientation is key. You know, because if you don't do that, if you don't provide good information, then Google will. Disintermediation is occurring all around the world. Now sometimes that's good. Maybe Google should be a partner in giving access to government information. Google is becoming part of governments around the world. One of their goals is to create the electronic health record because governments have failed in doing that. Future government's going to be open, porous, based on inter and intra-jurisdictional service delivery and challenges of the 21st century necessitate a new model of government and governance. They also require a new model of leadership. So this is a time of great peril, and it's also a time of uh, great opportunity. And I stand up uh, in front of you with great humility, because I don't think there's a more important uh, job in the world, or a tougher job, than to be a government leader uh, today. And, uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, there's a French uh, pilot from the Second World War. His name was Saint-Exupéry. He said, we should welcome the future for soon it will be the past, but we should respect the past for it was once all that was humanly possible. I mean, we all did what was possible, but I'm convinced 
it's now possible to go forward. And another Frenchman, Victor Hugo, says there's nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. Has the time come for a new paradigm in government and governance? I think so, and I wish you the very best in achieving it. And I look forward to working uh, with all of your uh, agencies going forward if you're interested. Thank you very much. Thank you.